What's up, my wizards? It's Dev from Saboom Tig. We like it a magic, in case you hadn't heard by now. You should know at this point, but anyway, there's only like a week left in deck tech season as I record this right now. So I've only got a couple of more shots to present decks to you. So I wanted to lead this week with one that I know is really, really cool and interesting, and I had to get it in at some point before the season ended. Let's talk about Jund Warriors. Oh, and by the way, before we go any further, yeah, I know she's back there. Finn's going to be fine. Finn's okay. By the way, the reason he hangs out right here, like, all the time, isn't because he's dead or sad or anything. It's because that's where his heater is, and he likes hanging out next to his heater. So there's, there's that for you. But anyway, back to this deck for just a second, right? We should spend some time talking about the deck and not just fish and cats. I know what you guys come here for, but I still want to talk MTG occasionally. <laughs> Here's the thing about this deck. It's the brainchild of one Mr. Frank Karsten. They might sound familiar, or you just might know who that is, because he's fairly famous around these parts as the math guy. If you ever heard anybody, myself included, quote you statistics about how many lands you should play to hit a certain number of sources by a desired turn, or even more esoteric stuff like how many dinosaurs to play in your deck to get Thunderherd Migration to go off on turn two, or how many legends to play in your deck to get Mox Amber to work by a certain turn. All of this comes from the brain of Mr. Karsten, but he is also a pro player in his own right, and he decided to register a deck like this, very much like this, for Mythic Championship Cleveland. So you know this is a well-thought-out deck with tons of arithmetic involved. And you gotta commend how this deck came together. What Carson has been able to do here is create a deck that's actually many decks. For one, it's an unclaimed territory deck. Yeah, it's been a long time, if ever, since I've shown you lands first. And I'm not gonna show you the entire mana base yet, but do know that before we go into this deck, you have to know that it is, before most things, an unclaimed territory deck. We're gonna name warriors when we play this, and this will make everything much, much easier. The reason I tell you about unclaimed territory at the very beginning is because the mana absolutely could not work in this deck if we didn't play all four copies of this card. But not only is this an unclaimed territory deck, it's also a Goblin Chain Whirler deck. You see, Territory allows us to effectively play 22 red sources to make sure that we can get Goblin Chain Whirler on turn three. Because it's a warrior. Look at that type line. A lot of people focus on the Goblin part. Turns out the other part can be important too, because Territory will not only allow us to play this on three, but it'll allow us to play things of other colors on turns before that. We'll talk about that in just a second, but... Let's focus on Mr. Whirly Boy for just a minute. You know enough about this card <laughs> to know that it's a driving force in standard. And as mono blue decks and mono white decks begin to rise up against the slower decks in the format, Goblin Chain Whirler will reclaim his place as an important card. Now, calling Chain Whirler a good card isn't exactly a hot take or anything. Everybody knows that. It's really about what you play around Goblin Chain Whirler because you have to contort the mana base so much in order to consistently play this card on turn three. But leave it up to Karsten to finally craft a mana base that allows you to play two other colors on top of Goblin Chain Whirler and actually play non-red cards on turn one and two. You see... In other ways, besides being an Unclaimed Territory deck or a Goblin Chain Whirler deck, this is also a Pelt Collector deck. Despite having to play Goblin Chain Whirler on turn three, that's our number one priority. This deck still has 11 untapped green sources available to play Pelt Collector on turn one, and pretty much everything in the deck will grow your Pelt Collector in a variety of ways, you know? You have creatures that can usually make this grow both when they enter and when they die. There's a lot of easy ways to make Collector grow in this deck, and he starts a theme, actually, of cards that are just fine when you play them on curve, but they get way better as the game goes on. But aside from just creatures that get better as the game goes on, we've also got a suite of creatures that are able to come back from the graveyard. Resilient creatures. We need those. The first example is Gutter Bones. Three copies of this. That's right. We're playing two different one-drops that aren't red in a Goblin Chain Whirler deck. Just like Pelt Collector, Frank has made 11 different ways on turn one of actually casting a gutter bone. It's pretty admirable. This card looks really good against Esper, but things like Seal Away and Vraska's Contempt, Ixalan's Binding, are obviously quite good against it and completely circumvent its ability to come back. But put it this way, if they waste a Vraska's Contempt or a Seal Away on a gutter bones, then you're actually in a pretty good position. So this card will at least continuously threaten to come back against some decks, and control opponents have to worry about one or two damage spinning out of control into more damage on later turns because you're able to get your gutter bones back. The card just does an awful lot right now. 
Now our two drops are going to continue the theme of creatures that get better as the game goes on, or that we can at least get value out of as the game goes on. Starting with Growth Chamber Guardian, one of the best examples of a creature like that in the entire deck. This is just a bear when you first play it, a 2-mana two 2-2. Two -two which I was not necessarily sold on. Same thing with Gutter Bones. I wasn't sold on these cards when I first started researching this deck, but turns out these are paramount to how the deck is constructed and how it's supposed to flow, kind of. I considered Zyrtok Goblin for this spot, but yeah, I will concede again that Growth Chamber Guardian is just a better creature all around aside from the very first turn that you play it. You get past that and suddenly your Growth Chamber Guard Guardian's getting bigger and it's bringing more crab people into play. And this is a great top deck, too. It's not a terrible card on curve, but when you rip it on turn 7 or 8 or something like that, you're going to love to get it because you'll have all the extra mana you need to get activations and play more Growth Chamber Guardians. Just one copy of this card threatens to spiral out of control if you get it in the late game and it actually resolves. But another 2-drop that's fine on curve but can be way better later on in the game is Rixmati Reveler. This also wants us to enable Spectacle, which we won't always do, but don't worry. Even if you rip this off the top of your library on turn 12 or whatever, and it's the only card in your hand, well, you can play it and draw a card without having to discard. Note that it doesn't say, if you do discard a card, you draw. You just draw a card doesn't matter. So if you have no other cards in your hand, it's just basically a bigger Dusk Legion Zealot that doesn't damage you and there's nothing, that sounds good <laughs> to me, but if you have enabled Spectacle that turn and you have the mana to pull it off, then you can always just draw three. That's good. That's very good. <laughs> you know, this will give you a ton of gas in the late game and it's another good card to play either on curve to fix some of the stuff that you drew in the early game, fix your hand a little bit and get your draws looking better, or Conversely, you can just play it a little bit later on in the game and draw half of a full grip. There's nothing wrong with this card. Even if, again, you can't enable Spectacle when you draw it late, it's still a drawn card. Now, to finish off the two drops here, we're also playing two copies of Crawl Harpooner here in the main deck. Yet another example of a creature that's at least okay. This one is slightly above curve if you play it on turn two and it has no actual enter the battlefield trigger. Sometimes still not okay. Grows your pelt collector. Occasionally grows your pelt collector when it comes into play and when it dies. If it dies really quickly thereafter, you'll get a 3-3 pelt collector and that's it's even bigger than Crawl Harpooner, technically. <laughs> All of that is good, but again, if you rip this up off the top of your library on turn 8, then usually it's going to do some real work for you. This is great against the mono blue decks in the format, good against sideboarded in Lear Dawnbringers and such, even Niv Mizzets if the game has gone on that long enough. Crackling Drake, Enigma Drake, there's just no end to the amount of value you can get in the late game off of a Crawl Harpooner. It basically turns into a sorcery speed, two mana plummet, and that can be okay depending on the situation, but again, if you just need an early creature to fill out your curve, grow your Pelt Collector, and start attacking. It does that pretty well, too. And note that it's a warrior. You know, you can do really stupid stuff in this deck, like first turn Unclaimed Territory into Gutter Bones, second turn any land that produces red into this Crawl Harpooner, and then third turn you just drop another red producing land and play Goblin Chain Whirler. That's... It's ridiculous. <laughs> but Chain Whirler isn't the only 3-drop we're playing in this deck, because since we're playing green, we also get access to Gruul Spellbreaker, which is conveniently also a warrior, you know? I think this deck was supposed to exist, just with the number of warriors that are competitive playable um, that are all in the Jun colors here. And as far as 3-mana creatures in this format go, there's really not much of a better deal than this. It's like Goblin Chain Whirler, and that's about it. You know, you get a hasty 3-3 three, three or a big 4-4. Four, four. Either way, it tramples, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> Take that every day. And, of course, the big part is they can't settle the wreckage you, which is really dumb against Esper. Note how much main deck action we have against Esper. You know, cards like Gutter Bones that can come back a little bit later in the game. Now this, a little, a little bit of resiliency, and we're not done either with creatures like that. For instance, Rekindling Phoenix is another creature that fights control really well. In this case, again, because it's resilient. Between this and Gutter Bones, we have seven different creatures that can easily come back from the graveyard, and they absolutely must exile this to have any real hope against it. So the curve of Gruul Spellbreaker into Rekindling Phoenix almost guarantees that they won't be able to settle you when you finally do get around to attacking with your Phoenix. 
And really, the team of Gruul Spellbreaker and Phoenix has been a known quantity in Gruul midrange for a while in this format. And of course, the team of Turn 3 Goblin Chain Whirler into Turn 4 Rekindling Phoenix is also a known quantity in the Mono Red Aggro decks in the format. So, this deck has a couple of different teammates that it usually sees in other decks, but we get to play them all in this deck. Pretty much no matter what you lead into Rekindling Phoenix with on Turn 3, it's going to be a pretty good sequence. That's actually all of the creatures in the entire deck right now. We actually top out at just four mana in this deck. That keeps us lean and streamlined, you know. We get seven one drops, nine two drops, eight three drops, and four four drops. That leaves us a few spots for spells, and the most important one here is Status Statue. You knew this would probably come up. I actually considered making this the second card I talked about in this video. That's how, quote, important it is. But honestly, you can easily win games in this deck by just curving out and never actually playing Status Statue. But of course, we do have the four mana play of Goblin Chain Whirler into Status Statue, Wrath Your Entire Team. That's pretty stupid. I shouldn't have to tell anybody. It works against pretty much any aggro deck in the format, given that you can resolve that combo. But of course, there's also the statue part of the card, which gives us a little bit of removal against a number of targets. You know, this is four mana creature removal, a little overpriced, but you'll take it a lot of the time. You know, especially a little bit later in the game, you don't mind spending four mana for your creature removal if it gets something important out of your way. Plus, this also kills enchantments, which is great. That's really, really good right now against Wilderness Reclamation, Search for Iskanta, History of Banalia, Experimental Frenzy, Theater of Horrors. There are a ton, even, you know, Ixalan's Bindings and Seal Aways and stuff. A lot of important enchantments right now that, stat that statue can target. But, of course, you can also just kill creatures and even the occasional artifact. But that's not all the removal we're playing here. I'm running three copies of Lightning Strike main deck. Now, one of the big differences main deck between my list and Frank's list is that he's running a copy of Collusion or Col uh, yeah, Collision Colossus. We'll talk about that when we get to the sideboard. Instead, he's running two Lightning Strikes. I'm running three Cutting the Main Deck Collision. We can talk about whether or not that's a good decision, but for the most part, Lightning Strike is going to take out a majority of the flying creatures minus Tempest Gen and Lyra Dawnbringer and Niv Mizzet. Um, that you'd want to take out with a Collision Colossus. All the other ones are mostly mono blue creatures and, you know, flying creatures in mono white like a late game Sky Marcher Aspirant. Lightning Strike is still just as good against them while giving you another main deck way of enabling Spectacle for Rick's Mighty Reveler or Gutter Bones, which I think is really important and it's not as dead in game one against the Esper decks. And finally, we're playing one main deck copy of Find Finality here. Really good grindy card will help you at least keep up with the grind of a Sultai deck that also gets to play this card. And is pretty decent in game one against decks that just play an overload of removal. Anything that plays, you know, 10, 12, or more pieces of main deck removal, Fine Finality can be great against just on the front half. This allows you to get a ton of gas back in the late game and adds to our resiliency score a little bit, which is going to be good against most of the decks in the format, whether it's Mono Blue or Esper for that matter. But the second half is specifically good against a lot of the aggro decks in the format. You know, again, Mono Blue when Resolve, this is a fine card, but Mono White, even Blue White again, when Resolve, this is fantastic against, and it's even decent against the Gruul and Rakdos sort of mid-range and aggro decks that, you know, kind of populate Tier 2 in this format. So there's just so much you can do with Fine Finality, almost no matter who you're playing against. Now we're playing 25 lands in this deck to make sure that everything rounds out. Even though the curve is relatively low, we still have to make sure that we have enough sources of each color. Plus, we have some flood protection in this deck in the form of, say, Gutter Bones or Grow Chamber Guardians. So we're trying to hedge our bets, even though we're playing maybe one more land than looks necessary. we got to hit these sources. Even in a deck with unclaimed territory, we have to make sure things run smoothly. So we have 18 red sources aside from unclaimed territory, 11 green and 11 black. But if you add unclaimed territory, suddenly we have 22, 15, and 15, which makes the deck run much, much more smoothly. Now let's take a look at our sideboard. There are some differences in my sideboard and Frank's too. As a matter of fact, there are more differences in the board than there are in the main, but there are the two copies of Collision Colossus. I want to talk about this first. This will come in in a lot of matchups. In game two and three against Control, you'll have to contend with Lyra Dawnbringer and sometime Niv Mizzet, so this will definitely come in against them. Also, Things like Drakes, you obviously want Collision Colossus, but even against Mono Blue, they play a fair degree of flying creatures. You'll need another copy of these, especially since 
It's better, again, against Tempest Gen than a card like Lightning Strike is, so you'll often take out the Strikes to put in more copies of this. The Strikes will come out in a few different matchups. By the way, Collision Colossus is also great against the odd Angels deck you'll come across every now and again. But back to Lightning Strike, you won't always take out Lightning Strike to fit this card, but one of the reasons you might take out Lightning Strike is to fit Lava Coil. Very often you'll want both pieces of removal, but Lava Coil could go in the main deck. We're just trying to enable Spectacle so much that Lightning Strike is almost certainly the better pick. But Lava Coil will still find its way in against Mono Red because of Phoenix mostly, but there are lots of other reasons to board it in against a natural aggro matchup. It'll come in against Drakes too, just like the last card, Collision Colossus. Come in against Gruel Midrange to kill Spellbreakers and Rekindling Phoenix and other four toughness creatures for that matter. It'll also come in against White Weenie because that's an aggro deck. Mono Blue decks it comes in to kill Tempest Gen. Soul Tie it'll come in. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of reasons to board in a Lava Coil, but again, in game one, we mostly want to concentrate on making our deck run as smoothly as possible, and we don't want a dead card like Lava Coil against decks like Esper. We also want to enable Spectacle as much as possible. So again, Lightning Strike might be the better choice for the main deck, but Lava Coil is going to come in all the time. Cinder Vines will also come in as even more enchantment hate against cards like Reclamation, Search for His Contact, Experimental Frenzy, at all, but this also has a little bit of application against decks like Arc Like Phoenix and Is It Drakes that are going to be playing a bunch of spells all in one turn. Speaking of Arc Like Phoenix, by the way, that's why we're carrying a copy of Fiery Cannonade aside from the, you know, aggro decks. This will obviously come in against White Weenie, Mono Blue, Tokens even, Green White Tokens. Fiery Cannonade has a lot of, of you know, relevance against, but note that it's instant speed, so it's also really relevant against Arc Like Phoenix decks. Keep that in mind. There's also Duress, and I'm playing three copies of Duress, where Frank was only playing two copies of Duress, but I think this is just that important of a sideboard card, that even though we don't have all of the main deck ways of producing black on turn one, we do have seven untapped black sources on one. Not quite enough to, con to guarantee Duress, obviously, but I still think Duress is an important enough card on turn two against certain decks that it's worth playing. Mono Blue, Gates, Nexus, Control, Esper Control specifically, this is just an unbelievable card against and I want it as an option in the board. There's also Angrath, which looks like it just comes in against Esper, but this is actually pretty good against the Soul Tide decks and even the Gates decks for what it's worth, so there's more applications for Angrath than just Esper, but that's the best matchup you can play it in, given that you can resolve it. But cleaning things up here, we've also got a Banefire. Really the only match this comes in against is Esper, which makes me not necessarily want to play it. Frank was not playing it. This is another card that I'm playing that he was not. But I think that Banefire is just too good in the Esper matchup, despite the presence of cards like Absorb that they might be playing. I still think Banefire is too good against them, especially considering this is an aggro deck that's going to add up a number of damage <laughs> in the first few turns, but sometimes won't necessarily be able to uh, finish in the early game. So a card like Banefire can go a long way if we draw it on turn 7 or 8 to actually finishing the game off for us. But here are your power rankings right here. Final score of 68. That's the highest score in a good long time because I haven't really been covering competitive stuff. You know, my patrons have been doing, um, have been voting for like janky combo -y stuff, which I am all for. You guys know I'm that kind of magic player, but I like to cover a competitive deck every now and again. And Jund is definitely that. Lots of different angles of attack in this deck in a lot of different ways that your first three or four turn sequences can play out. You know, you might start on Pelt Collector or Gutter Bones. You might then progress to Rick's Mighty Reveler and fix your opening draw. You might progress to Growth Chamber Guardian and then start adapting it on the next turn. This deck is really versatile, sort of just in the way its first few turns can play out. You know, you might get Chain Whirler and Status on turn four, or you might not, but if you don't, you get Rekindling Phoenix, you get to lead into it with Gruel Spellbreaker or something like that. There are just a lot of different lines of attack this deck can take, and almost no matter what your starting seven is, given that you have the lands to play the cards in that starting seven, you should be able to get something good going on board. But, again, even if you get blown out, you get Wrathed, you know, you've got plenty of insurance in this deck, from Gutter Bones, to Fine Finality, to Rekindling Phoenix, to Grow Chamber Guarding with enough mana to adapt it. There's there's just so many different ways this deck can bounce back in the late game too.
It's not synergy driven, but there are a lot of little interactions in the cards. So I like that about it too. There's just, I could go on about this deck all night. Researching it's been a blast. Messing around with it has been a blast. And getting to talk about it has been fun too. So I hope you guys like it. It's easily one of the coolest, sort of most underground decks in the format right now. It might not be top tier or anything, but you can definitely take it to the top, especially with enough experience piloting the deck. This is one you got to get a few reps in with, but it's got a lot of spread against this format. So if you wanted to try this thing out, take it for a little, little test drive, then just click the first link in the description as usual. That'll take you over to TCG Play. They sponsor my content, but they're also where you're going to get this deck for the lowest price on the whole internet. So make sure you click that first link down there below me in the in the lower part of this YouTube webpage. Just click show more, and then a wealth of links will open up to you. Not only will I give you the link to TCG Player, check that out. It actually helps the channel when you click the link. But you can also find links to previous decks and videos that we've done. They're down there. Help out my metrics in that way. Or if you really want to help the channel, you can click that link and go to Patreon and just pledge $1 a month. That's all I ask, and I know I'm worth it because I'll let you vote on what videos you're going to see next. And I'll tell you what's going to happen 24 hours in advance before I actually upload to the channel. So try to give you a lot of value for a buck click that link if you're into it if not then just click the like button i really hope you enjoyed this fancy warriors deck two years after the fact remember when warriors was actually a thing in cons <laughs> a couple years after the fact we get this deck it might not be straight up a warriors deck but technically it is so i hope you enjoyed this thing and if you did click the like button a lot of works goes and in, work goes into these click subscribe if you're into it you know if you haven't done that yet now's probably the time i don't know why you're not subscribed war of the spark spoilers start next week seven days from this day so go ahead and make sure you're subscribed to the bell for the notification so you know when new cards come out you want to talk about those with me but with that i think all i got to say is make sure you let me know how you felt about it down there in the comments and I will catch you cats later. I'm Dev from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Make sure you spread love and be kind.